Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Let me get this privacy thing off, and we'll be good to go. Oh, that's right. All right, let's see. It's not up yet. It's going to get there. Right, let's go. Oops. Now, taking this long, please. Okay. Let's say we're going live in 52 seconds, but it's not live to you guys until. It's not coming up on my feed. It's not coming up on my feed. Oh, let me go back to my profile again. There we are. Okay, let me hit this button. It says edit privacy. I go public. I go done. Change. Ah, here we are. Okay. Always got to go through this hassle until I can learn how to do this. But for some reason, I want to, when I start doing a live feed, that it blocks it off. Facebook blocks me off as private. But now, of course, the purpose of a live feed is so you can make yourself uh, known to the public. So I have to play this little game with them every morning. So if you see me doing like this in the future, this is what I'm doing. I'm trying to correct this so we can all be on the same page. <laughs> Well, anyway, let's, uh, I'm going to go back, and so hang with me here. And, uh, well, even then I was talking to the wrong camera, but here I be, okay, over here. So I'm going to put this, and we're going to, now we're coming over here, and I've got to adjust my, get my camera on board here. There it is. All right. Put all that in there. Believe me, if I could do this before, do it. I wouldn't need to do it. Okay, so let's bring it on down here and see what we got. Okay, let's dial in. I call it dialing in. Let's see how close we can get. All right, there. Let's see. Come on. All right. Of course, this is a little book that I'm, I'm reading out and making my comments on. Here it is, here it is. 4,000 questions and answers. And uh, last, uh, yesterday, I was doing the, uh, it's called Catechisms. The Young Christian's Catechism right there. By the way, uh, this book was written in 1910. So I was just reading some of the questions and uh, making a comment on them, and such and such. All right, so. so. Uh, okay, so let's see. Where was I at? Let's see. I know I did Lydia, so let's see. Okay, one, one number 30. That would be uh, right here. Can you see that okay? All right, I, maybe I can come in just a little bit closer. There we go. How about that? That's pretty cool. All right, number 30. It says, what was the Lord's last command to his apostles? Now think now. Okay, this last command was, Go ye therefore into all the world, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and those that believe shall be saved. And those that believe not, well, I don't have to answer that question. I hope not. If you're damned already, the Bible says, uh, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. 
So the flip side of that is, if you're not in Christ Jesus, you might not feel like you're on death row, but you're on spiritual death row. So he gave this uh, command to his apostles, and we can read all about it like this cool little verse says, Matthew 29, 19. Okay, number 31. Who in the Bible is called the light of the world? There you go, Jesus. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And if any man have not the light of life, he's walking in darkness, and, he's, and you're hating your brother. So that's the blind leading the blind. What was Jesus' promise to his disciples? I am with you always. This is interesting because Jesus told them that, that he's with them. But there's a, something else to consider here. God is not only with us. Uh, the Bible refers to him as Emmanuel, God with us. And the us are talking about in that prophecy given at Jesus' birth. The us are the nation of Israel, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So he's, when he's saying he's with them, he really, uh, at those particular apostles, okay, the Lord's showing this right now. With those particular apostles, they had not yet died yet, and they were still alive, but soon as they went uh, to the upper room and got the baptism of the Holy Spirit, uh, Jesus was officially, they were officially adopted into the body of Christ. And at the, in the, the upper room, they became what we call Messianic Jews. These are Jews who believe in Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah, and we call them Messianic Jews. So from this point on, even though they didn't know about the gospel of grace at this time, they were considered Messianic Jews. And so the term, I am with you always, means by reason of deduction, this meant he was with them up to the upper room or to his resurrection. And as soon as they received the promise of the Father, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, to receive power to witness, they then went from Jesus being with them to in them. Paul refers to as Christ in us, the hope of glory. So that's my comment on that. What was the great honor which conferred upon Mary Magdalene? She was the first to see Jesus after the resurrection. Well, I believe Mary Magdalene was uh, the honor I believe she had conferred upon her uh, was she was the first one to tell people that he's alive. That would be an honor. Praise the Lord. But this might be the Mary Magdalene that uh, I'm not quite sure which Mary it was. But there was one Mary that washed uh, Jesus' feet with her hair, dried with her hair, and uh, dried her, his hair, his feet with the, her hair, his, her tears only. And he was so moved, he got rebuked by the people he's sitting at the table with him. And they said, don't you know what kind of woman this is? Well, guess what? Jesus knew. He had forgiven her. And he said, let her alone. Jesus opened his big mouth and said, this could have been money. She's using this fancy oil on your feet. We could have used that to help the poor. Jesus rebuked him and said, hey, leave her alone. This is a good thing. It's not only a good thing. She's anointing my feet for, the burial, for my, my burial symbolically. And Jesus said to this, I think it was this one, uh, he said about her, he says, I want this story told. I want this story read. The story is you're writing something down. Then guys, write this down, what she done for me, for a memorial to her. A memorial to her. When Jesus tells you, remembers, the only other memorials I know about in the Bible is Israel or Jerusalem. He, they, he is a living memorial. Jerusalem is a living memorial before, uh, the, uh, before the Lord. Look at it this way. Perhaps have you heard of this veterans war wall that travels around uh, the country and it's this enormous wall and what it does, it's alive. The names are kind of fluctuating. They're kind of going in and up and in and out, and it's a living wall. And did you know that, that 
Israel was a living memorial, or Jerusalem was a living memorial, meaning is if God ever gave up, like if he ever went to sleep and he got up, it's right. In other words, let's put it this way. It's in his living room, okay? You have things in your living room that you like close to you. He's got that living memorial that's changing colors or whatever it does. It reminds him about Jerusalem, where he's going to live. He says, uh, he says, I'm going to write my name there. The devil knows this too. But anyway, let's move on. Who bore Christ's cross to the crucifixion? The guy named Simon. When Jesus was going, I wrote a song called Dia, uh, Dia Bella Rosa. And it means, Bia means by way of. Della Rosa is the path of Jesus' suffering when he carried the, his own cross up to a point uh, to Golgotha where he could not carry it anymore. And Simon happened to be the man the Roman uh, spied out and he says, you help that man carry the cross. Well, Simon was a little reluctant, but he relented. And so he helped Jesus bear the cross. Next one. Who wrote the last book of the Bible? John. John is the only disciple, as far as I know. They tried to kill him. But I think he died eventually. He was in Babylon when he died. He got off the island of Patmos and got over there. And uh, I don't know what happened to him there. Okay, what was the occupation of Paul Apostle, a tent maker? Okay, uh, on further study, I remember someone making a remark, his tent making wasn't just like regular tents. It was some sort of special trade that uh, the Jews did, and that was a beautiful trade. Okay, it says, who in the New Testament was given power to handle serpents unharmed? Paul. Okay. Well, actually, uh, I believe that promise went to all the Jews, all the apostles. They all could have, right now to this day, uh, the apostles uh, had that. They got filled with the Spirit. They could cast out devils. They could uh, lay hands on the sick and they would recover. And it says, the Lord working with them confirmed his word with signs and wonders. So one of them, but he's bringing this out, Paul, is because... I don't know if you know the story. Paul was being was arrested, and he appealed to Caesar, and he wanted to go to to uh, uh, Rome on, on an appeal. So he had a special guard that uh, accompanied him on the ship. They got on the ship, and while they were on that ship, uh, Paul told them, "We shouldn't set forth now because." Uh, bad weather, but they did anyway, so they ended up, the ship wrecked. So all the prisoners and everything, Paul said, don't kill anybody. So they all swam to shore, and they got there on the shore, and while they were waiting there for ship repair or something, the uh, uh, Paul went out to gather firewood, and there were some local natives there, and they became friends. And so when Paul was out in the woods gathering firewood, uh, a serpent, uh, bit him. He reached his hand to the wood pile and a snake bit him. And uh, there were some natives there that saw this. And they all started talking amongst themselves and says, well, he must have been some really bad guy. He did bad things because he got his karma. If you believe in that stuff, of course not. But they were suspicious, full of uh, suspicions and uh, rituals and stuff. And so this is what occurred. So Paul looked at the serpent, shook it off, and it fell out and scattered away. But he looked at his wrist, and it showed the marks and where he had been bitten. And the natives went into a deep freeze about that. But eventually, they kept watching for him to die. And Paul just continued gathering firewood. <laughs> and he brought it back to the fire. And I imagine they were still there trying to check this strange guy out. Uh, a serpent, they saw with their own eyes, a snake bit him but nothing happened to him. So that goes to a part of the Great Commission that where it says, if you shall drink any deadly things, it shall no otherwise harm you. And it don't mean snake handling. A lot of uh, churches used to take this out of context, and they would actually bring uh, poisonous snakes 
uh, into the church building and start playing with them, talking about that scripture. But some of them, unfortunately, got bit and died. They went to be with the Lord early because they didn't know the, uh, the context of that scripture and what it meant. But uh, evidently, God didn't mean that because uh, they went to be with the Lord early. But there's been very few places like that, but they were because of superstition. Okay. It says, what were the parts of three parts of the scripture that Jesus said contained prophecies about him? Okay. The law of Moses, the Psalms, and the prophets. Uh, this reminds me, a lot of times Jesus says, the Son of Man goes as it is written of him in his journey. Okay. So, these are three places. He said, all of these things must be fulfilled. And there's a lot of these prophecies. And these, uh, uh, the law of Moses is fulfilled. Psalms and the prophets, uh, there's a few of them has got to be fulfilled there concerning him. Quote the Savior's words when struck in the face. Well, I remember he struck in the face. He says, why smitest me? He said, if I've done evil, okay. But I've done nothing. I was uh, i done nothing in secret. He says, "What you guys hear me preach? I, I preached it on the housetops. I preached it in the the uh, the synagogue and everywhere. I've done no evil. So if I've done evil, okay. But I haven't done any evil. So why are you just uh, slapping me around? That's what Jesus said, basically. Where is recorded our Lord's first act of intercession? Well, let me think about that. Well, the first thing uh, comes to me is the intercession he did. Uh, you turn to John 17. He did all types of intercession. But I don't really know when was the first time. I know he prayed a lot in the Garden of Gethsemane. But his first act of intercession, I don't know. But we can find out by going to John 17, 15. But I guess I'm partly right because I recognize that chapter 17. So it would be in that chapter. I think he said, I pray not for these only that the Father has given me, but I pray for those on whom they shall believe on me, that would be us, through their word. He said, I pray that you not take them out of the world, but you keep them in the world and uh, keep them from the evil one. Okay. How can the Bible be called the Word of God when written by man? Well, Second Timothy is going to tell you uh, it was written uh, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit as, as, as they moved on holy men and they picked up the pen because the Spirit of God was directing them by the Spirit and they wrote these things down. That's how they did it. Proof from the Old Testament that Jesus shared his people's sorrow. What well, it tells us there in Isaiah. Uh, he uh, said he opened up his mouth like a lamb. He was led to, saw, uh, to slaughter. Uh, he made intercession for Israel. Shared his uh, people's sorrows. And it says uh, about him suffering, he says that uh, uh, he endured the cross for the joy set before him. He endured the suffering. And so uh, part of the suffering was uh, uh, basically uh, when they slapped him around and they scourged him and everything like that before he went to the cross. And so verse 43, what is the unpardonable sin, the sin against the Holy Spirit? Well, it's kind of got different aspects here. That would fall under blasphemy and it would fall against making fun when the Holy Spirit is doing a work. You don't call the Holy Spirit's work uh, something that the devil's doing. So you got to be careful there. Because Jesus told them, uh, they told him he cast out devil by the devil. And Jesus said, uh, a man, a house that is divided cannot be stand. And he said, now you make and make fun of me, and you can make fun of my dad. But if you make fun of the Holy Spirit, what you're doing here, you're standing on dangerous ground. You're standing on dangerous ground. 
But I would like to add this. You're not going to hear a lot about it. The Pharisees and religious leaders he was talking to about that, they weren't even saved yet. So it was a mixture, in my opinion, of them uh, saying blasphemy, attributing the work of the Holy Spirit to the devil and the sin of unbelief. The people in hell now are basically there, generally, not only for their sins that they didn't uh, uh, get forgiveness for, but the, the main sin, the reason it keeps them life in hell, is the sin of unbelief. Uh, a lot of people in, in our judicial system, we have sentences of life, sentence in some states. And, but what happens is, if you're a good guy, life sentence, you could come up for parole maybe after 10 years, even if you got a life sentence, and you have the hope of getting out. But when you go to, to uh, the devil's hell, prepare for him and his demons, uh, that sin of unbelief is a life sentence forever. A life sentence forever. If you reject God's only plan of redemption for your soul, because Jesus paid the price for you, then you reject your only hope of ever, ever uh, avoiding hell. Okay. So what happens there, uh, you think you have a get-out date after in, in prison. I've been in prison. I look for that date, my get-out date, and uh, my roll-out date. But there's no roll-out dates in hell. The only date that they're going to be rolling out is after the thousand years, Jesus' millennial reign. And, Jesus, and they're going to have the great white throne judgment. And then hell and the people in it and the demons that torment the people, they're all going to stand before God at the great white throne. And he will read the charges of them. Their names will not be found in the Lamb's Book of Life. And it says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet are. Uh, Satan gets to run around for about a thousand years. And then God's going to toss him in there too. And all the people who didn't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Okay. Which one of our Lord's miracles was worked by the utterance of the word? And it says, utterance of one word. Which one of our Lord's miracles was worked? Well, the only one I can think of, of is peace be still. But that's three words. And then uh, he says to Lazarus, Lazarus, come forth. But that's two words. So my answer is, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. That's a good question. Okay. Now, give the text in which the Lord distinguishes between his divine and his human sonship. Human sonship. And so, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know that particular text between uh, divine and human sonship. Okay. okay. Prove that. But it does say, if we turn to John 5.19, but for time's sake, I don't want to turn there. Okay. 46. Prove that even in the presence of Jesus, salvation was voluntary. Hmm. John 6, 67. I don't know. I don't know. Well, Jesus, all thing I know is that uh, uh, it says, if any man come to me, it says, one day in the great uh, invitation, it says, uh, whosoever will, let him come to me and drink of the water of the life that I give freely. That's one. And one, he was talking to the Pharisees, the religious leaders, and he says, you search the scriptures, but if you realize if you search them correctly, you would realize that they're pointing to the guy that's talking to you right now. So he told them that they search the scriptures out, that, and they rightly divided, they would see that Jesus did all the signs 
the Father said the Messiah would do when he come. But for some reason, they couldn't get a hold of it. That truth was hidden from them. The poor souls are still in hell now. Quote a chapter from Isaiah in which the vision of the fourfold office of Christ is enumerated. Well, I don't know that at the tip of my tongue. So, in three words, give the character of Christian. Hope maketh not ashamed, where Paul talks about faith, hope, and charity, and the grace of all these is love. What a remarkable event was announced by the shepherds. Uh, well, that's the ones uh, that were dwelling and keeping the sheep and the lambs used for uh, the mosaic sacrifice at the temple. These were special sheep. These shepherds had a special flock. Uh, I don't know if they were all unblemished, but they were pretty close, and they were just not regular sheep. But, of course, the angel appeared to them and told them about the great news uh, of, of Jesus being born in Bethlehem. And they should go check him out. And that's what they did. Prove from the Bible that God promises to supply the temporal wants of his people. Well, I don't know about that, but I know it says, uh, Philippians 4.19, I think it says, But my God shall supply all of your needs by his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. That would be my verse. Well, my friends, that's what I've been. Uh, thank you for stopping in. Let me uh, let me see what this next category is. Let's see. Okay, we could go on to some more of this. Let's let's do a few more. Okay. All right. This one says, "What prophecy says that Jesus was the Son of God?" Answer. I will declare the decree the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Psalm 2, verse 7. Wow. What prophecy tells of his birth in Bethlehem? I've always loved this verse. Let's read it again. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, Yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be the ruler of Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old and from everlasting. Everlasting, that means it's got to be Jesus. All right? Okay. And the reason it says Bethlehem or Frata is because uh, you take like the word Mooresville, okay, or any common name, uh, Washington, there's a Washington, Pennsylvania, and Washington, different states. So the reason Ephrata is there, the prophecy Micah puts out here, he wanted to be exact about it. So the Spirit of God told him it's like Indianapolis, Indiana, it's Bethlehem, Ephrata. It isolated that particular Bethlehem because there was more than one. Okay. Give a short history from the Perth of the birth of Jesus. Wow, this is cool. Okay, it says, here we go. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And he shall be a sign unto you. So, Wonders and signs are generally for the Jews. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. I believe this is the prophecy they gave the shepherds who were out attending the sheep. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, you notice they weren't singing. Angels don't sing. Okay. But contrary to what we think, but they don't. But they praise. They were praising God, and what were they saying? Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill toward men. This is God's will of thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Peace on earth, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to another, Let us now go even to Bethlehem, and see the thing which has come to pass which the Lord has made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary 
and Joseph and the babe lying in the manger. Wow, this is beautiful. We're a little ahead of Christmas, but that's okay. Tell what happened to Jesus as an infant. Okay. Okay. And when they were departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be there until I bring you word, for Herod will seek the young children to destroy him. Uh, this is when the, uh, uh, the three wise men came to town. There wasn't three, but I like to say three. This is when he rose. It says, so when they, the word got out that they were there, I guess they had a mighty big entourage, and so... Herod invited him to the palace, and in the discussion he was inquiring, and they told them they were following this star, and the star was from all, they could see it all the way from the east, and, it, and according to their calculations and astronomy and everything, that this would be a sign of the Messiah. Okay, so uh, he thought... He didn't want to share his kingdom with anyone, so he told the wise men, when you find him, let me know, and I want to come and worship him too. But he was lying. Okay, and what happened was, he put the word out. He was so scared. Of course, uh, the, the wise men never returned, and so Herod put the word out to kill every young child. I think it was under two years old. And there is a, a, a prophecy that said, uh, Rama, uh, uh, she's crying for her children. I think it's re something, I forget her name, but it started with the R. And she's crying for her children. Is it Rachel? I'm not sure. And it says she would not be comforted, meaning that someone had got her child and killed it because of Herod's fear of Messiah outdoing him, being. Uh, the one, the worship, I mean, the main guy, the main person. And so she was one of them who got cut up in that destruction of infants two years and uh, younger. But so the angel told Joseph to go to Egypt, and they stayed there until Herod eventually was uh, killed in his own court by his family. And so then he gave him another dream, and they brought him back. And that's how he ended up in Nazareth. It says, When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. And there, until the death of Herod, there it is, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. It's a beautiful thing. Beautiful thing. Give two Bible verses that tell of the boyhood of Jesus. When do we know the one? He's sitting in the temple. Here he is. When he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. I know you, believe, I know, you know the story about that. I will try to cap on it real quickly. Uh, they went to the feast. This was the custom. And when they returned from the feast and they were in their little entourage going home, uh, they noticed uh, that Jesus wasn't with them. So they went all the way back, Mary and, his, uh, and Joseph, and they found Jesus sitting in the temple, answering and asking questions with all the religious leaders. And they said to Jesus, uh, Jesus, what are you doing here? Uh, don't you know we were freaking out because we found that you wasn't with us in the caravan? And Jesus, why did you be sorrowing about me? Don't you know I should be about my father's business? Okay. But I don't know. It says, oh, the two Bible verses, not two instances, but that's, that's the one about the boy. But anyway, if you want to even move back further from that, there's a record that when Jesus is born, uh, on the eighth day, they took him into the temple where this guy named Simon was, and he was the head guy there in the temple. I don't know if he was a priest or prophet or what, probably a priest. And uh, when he, uh, they gave him to, uh, to be sprinkled or sanctified, I'm not quite sure, I would, maybe circumcised. I don't know what the, the problem, the thing was, but 
he, they went in there after eight days and uh, he said a prophecy over them about how great Jesus was and what was going to happen. And then another woman there named Anna, who was a prophetess, uh, she stayed in the temple day and night praying and making intercession for Israel. She told Mary that uh, a, sea, uh, a sword would pierce her heart and she would have great sorrow. So when Mary took her child to go through these officiating of these Jewish customs, when she back, when she went home, she pondered on these prophecies all of her life. And I'm seeing Mother Mary looking at Jesus hanging down from the cross, being crucified, when he's saying, Woman, behold thy mother. He's looking, she's looking at him, and she's saying, and the Lord brought that prophecy to pass, and she's thinking about that. She says, now I know what that prophecy means. It was a sad time for Mary. When Jesus was about to begin his ministry, what happened? In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, to make his path straight. What prophecies did this fulfill? The voice of him that cries in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, and make straight in the desert a highway to a God. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord. Uh, I'm not going to comment, but tomorrow when I get back, I'm going to jump off on this, because this is a very important time. This is the time where Israel, Israel had not heard anything from God over 400 years. This is called uh, the silent years in the Bible, between uh, Malachi and uh, John coming on the scene. We don't know why he's silent about it, but he's waiting for him to build the right roads in Rome and c connecting roads to, so that when the church gets started, they can follow these paths with a relative degree of safety to proclaim the gospel to all the known world around them. So but the, when, G, when John shows up and he starts baptizing in the river, there's a lot behind that I've learned, and I can't wait to share it with you. But until now, I wish above all things that you would prosper and be in good health, even as your soul is prospering. Christian and I wish you Merry Christmas. In Jesus' name, bye-bye.